Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Hiba Hussain, and I'd like to welcome you to the New America Foundation for a very, very timely discussion on the digital lives of teenagers. New America, as many of you may know, is a public policy institute that encourages new ideas and groundbreaking thinkers to address the next generation of challenges facing our nation and the world at large. So I'm part of the policy team at New America's Open Technology Institute, or OTI, among other issues, we here at OTI think a lot about how to make sure that new technologies are a positive tool for users and communities as a whole. So we're especially excited about Dina's book and this event. I'm really excited. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Mary Madden from the Pew Research Center, who will introduce our panelists and get the conversation started. Thank you so much, Hiba, and thank you to everyone at New America for hosting us here today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Mary Madden. I'm a senior researcher at the Pew Research Center's Internet Project here in DC. Um, and I'm joined by my wonderful colleague, Amanda Lenhart, who is the director of the teens and technology research that we do at the center. Um, I'm joined today also, of course, by the wonderful Dana Boyd, and we are honored to have the opportunity to discuss her uh, groundbreaking new book, It's Complicated, The Social Lives of Networked Teens. Dana is a longtime collaborator and friend of the Pew Internet Project, and her research on youth has been so influential for so many years that I can't possibly convey the, the range of her achievements within the few minutes I have here today. But her condensed tweetable bio is that she's a principal researcher at Microsoft Research, a research assistant professor in media, culture, and communication at NYU, and a fellow at Harvard's Berkman Center. In her spare time, while writing and preparing for the release of this book, she also decided to start a new research institute called Data and Society. Now, this book is about networked teens, um, and it's been eight years in the making. In many ways, it reflects the fruits of Dana's innovative approach to being a networked researcher. And as long as I've known Dana, she's approached each new project as a humble listener, eager to learn, engage, and be in conversation with those she studies, as well as those who study her work. What makes this book so unique is the way that it provides a platform for the voices of youth on these complex issues. Now, these issues are complicated. Issues like privacy, bullying, inequality. But Dana is a masterful guide, and she helps us to break down many of the myths associated with teens and technology use. And she helps us to understand the larger societal context for what's been happening so that we can understand the way teens engage with the technologies of today and the technologies of tomorrow. So without further ado, join me in welcoming Dana Boyd. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Mary, um, and thank you, Amanda, for joining me. And thank you to New America Foundation for having me here. Um, I guess I want to start by giving some context to this book. Uh, and then I'm actually looking forward. We'll start a little bit of a conversation here and then a conversation with all of you. Um, I was one of the first generation of young people who grew up online. Uh, and I got onto the internet as a teenager in part because my brother did the terrible, terrible thing of using up the phone line uh, when I was a teenage girl, making ridiculous beeping sounds that I didn't understand. Um, and I got very frustrated with him. And so uh, at one point, um, I sat down with him. And he showed me what he was doing. Uh, and it became this amazing uh, opportunity to see that the internet was actually made of people. Um, and that was this great eye-opening experience. Um, and for me, um, although it's actually really funny, I've got a high school classmate here in the room um, who I did spend some time online with. But most of my experiences online were with strangers, people who, at the time, it just wasn't a big deal to talk to different people around the globe. And indeed, you know, I spent time in particular with two really memorable interactions. One, during the first Gulf War, talking to military personnel uh, living uh, abroad, helping me understand the politics, the geopolitics of what was taking place, you know, in the ways that you know, a, a naive teenager was asking really dumb questions. Um, at the same time, I had this phenomenal encounter with a transgender woman who allowed me, again, to ask unbelievably inappropriate questions, whereas I worked out and started to understand gender and sexuality and, and the body. Um, and these were really transformative interactions for me as a teenager. 
So I went to college in order to study computer science, in order to build the systems uh, that you know, I had spent so much time being a part of. Um, and then I kept finding myself more and more curious about what it was that people were doing. This project began um, sort of on the tails of another project where I was looking at the rise of social media. Um, I was looking at early sites like Friendster uh, and eventually would end up looking at MySpace and continuing on. Um, and during that period, my advisor uh, came to me and said, hey, we, I've got this funding to look at young people. Have you, do you have any interest in young people? And I was like, yeah, I would love to understand how teenagers are making sense of these sites now that they're more mainstream, to understand their identities. And in many ways, I began this project expecting that young people would be as transformed by um, these new technologies as I was. And the fact that these were more mainstream would mean these huge transformations uh, in public life and in youth culture in general. And I think that probably the most shocking thing to me uh, embarking on this research project was to realize that the more things change, the more they seem to stay the same. Um, and that many of the things that we saw young people doing involving social media were the things that young people had always done. Hanging out, joking around, gossiping, flirting, just having fun with their friends. And so then it was a matter of figuring out why is it that they're going to these online media. And of course, you'd hear a lot of public rhetoric that it's this attractor. That it's, you know, it, it, this is what pulls them in. This is, it's all about the technology. And I was like, this doesn't actually make sense based on what I'm seeing. In fact, what I kept hearing from young people was that they would much prefer to be together face to face with their friends. They would much rather hang out. But there was something that they weren't allowed to. And they started giving me these laundry lists of the personal dynamics in their own houses that made it very difficult. Their parents were afraid. Um, they, couldn't, they couldn't go anywhere. People lived far away. And there was all of these excuses and explanations. So I started looking at what were the transformations of American society over the last 30 years that helped explain this. And what I saw was pretty interesting to think about. And um, maybe notable for many in the room who grew up with some of these uh, changes, which is that you know, it started with curfew uh, uh, laws. We saw an implementation of curfew laws in the 1980s in order to, in many ways, restrict young people's access to different kinds of public spaces. The response in the 1980s to latchkey culture was such that you know, we had all of these you know, understandings that we should overly structure our youth. We should make sure they're involved in tons of activities so they don't get themselves into trouble. Um, meanwhile, the combination of suburbanization and school choice meant that for an average teenager, their friend was going to live at a much larger geographic distance, that even if they could get onto a bike, they weren't going to easily be able to get to their friends. The rise of double parent working meant that you know, getting your parents to drive you someplace became really difficult. And of course, most places don't have public transportation. Um, you know, on top of this, we have all of these commercial enterprises saying we don't want young people to be a part of these environments. Malls kicked young people out. You know, places didn't want them if they didn't have money. And we saw a decline in young people's ability to actually spend money. A part of this was changes in terms of young people's opportunity to get work. Um, so for example, it's very hard to imagine an upper middle class, the idea of allowing a 12-year-old to babysit a two-year-old um, in contemporary situations. And yet, this was completely common you know, 30 years ago. And that change is really important. And of course, that's the black, you know, the black market money. Um, even the more legitimate money, um, thinking about the idea of working in fast food, which I certainly spent my teenage years doing, was, is become impossible for many young people not the least of which is because those jobs are now held by 50-somethings who have been destroyed by the current state of the economy. So you have all of these forces sort of pushing against young people's ability to truly get together, to hang out with their friends, and up pops the internet. And what you see is that rather than this serving as this allure, what it has done is provided a certain kind of relief valve. It has allowed young people to find a place of their own, to hang out with their friends, to socialize. And yet, as you've seen that you know, sort of take place and unfold, we've started to see parents and uh, parents, journalists, um, educators start to panic about the technology. To blame the technology as, as the thing that's like absolutely devastating for young people's lives without appreciating all of the reasons that young people have gathered. Um, and so that's you know, where I started this book. And then what I did structurally in the book, and which I'm sure we'll get into in conversation, is I went through a whole host of different you know, anxieties that I kept hearing back at me. Um, it usually starts with kids these days, right? And kids these days do terrible things of a variety of form, right? You know, they must be addicted to technology. They don't care about privacy. You know, bullying is rampant and terrible. All of these you know, online safety issues are flourishing. You know, those are sort of the negative narratives you hear. On the positive end, you hear these really utopian visions of 
the internet must you know, save all of us. It's the great equalizer. These kids, they're digital natives. They understand everything. And I was like, regardless of whether we talk about the extreme utopian or dystopian, this doesn't sit right. And so I wrote this book to take all of those public notions uh, and those anxieties and try to tease them out with GASP data, um, which is really uh, sort of the bulk of this project is you know, you know, uh, almost a decade now of research into different aspects of things um, and triangulating not just my work, you know, but amazing work of my uh, collaborators and friends um, and trying to really tease out what we can understand about each of these phenomenon, what has legs, what has grounding, and what is much messier than we might think. And with that as an opening, I'll sort of turn it over, I think, to Amanda. Um, and, and I get down. to sit down. Get to sit down. We're going to talk. We're going to ask a bunch of questions. Thank you, Dana. That was, uh, I think, an amazing introduction to, um, to what's actually a really remarkable book. Um, and I, I have so many questions. But um, <laughs> I think let's start. Um, I think I want to go back to this idea that you talked about, about the internet. Um, one of the memes that we hear about the internet is that it's this great connector. It shows this great potential for connecting young people to other people and to new ideas that will help reduce prejudice and racism. Um, because partly, in the words of the famous cartoon, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog, right? So that people can be you know, uh, removed from the, the politics of the body. But I think you found something different, perhaps, with teens. And I hope you'll elaborate on that for us. Sure. You know, for most young people, they go to technology not to interact with strangers, not to even go through the process of performing fake identities, but in many ways just to socialize with their peers. And because they're there with their classmates from school, their friends from summer camp, their, you know, uh, class, uh, their you know, peers from religious organizations, et cetera, they assume that the people they're interacting with know who they are. And the result of which is that they don't feel like they have to go through a process of telling those friends who they are. And I, the way that I saw it is this amazing kind of identity work um, over different technologies at different times. So I'll begin with MySpace, um, which used to ask these very specific questions, like, uh, where are you from? Uh, how much money do you make? You know, what is, you know, all of these, like, what is your age? And it was, you know, built off of the older versions of Friendster, which had a dating component to it. Right, so now you're, think about it, you're a teenager. Your friends know exactly who you are. So how much money do you make? Clearly you make $250,000 or more, right? <laughs> Obviously, um, you know, that aspirational desire is really strong. You know, you're a teenage boy and you're asked how old you are. Of course you think it's very funny to say you're 69, right? Like that <laughs> clearly makes a lot of sense. And you're told to say where you're from and you know, uh, you're tr you've got this crazy pull down menu um, where, haha, isn't it funny to choose the first or last thing? So all of a sudden we have all these teenagers from Afghanistan or Zimbabwe, right? Because that's clearly what you should list, or Christmas Island. Because who knew <laughs> that there was such a cool place as Christmas Island? Um, and so we see this sort of playfulness in this identity which is not about deception. It's not about trying to lie or trying to create these fake, fake identities, mm -hmm. but in many ways to say, why do these sites need to collect this information in the first place? And so we see this moment of, you know, because you're there with your friends, you're not trying to fake identities, you're there trying to hang out with them, and you're trying to deal with these different contexts that you know, you're operating in simultaneously. And so, to go back, to, to dig a little deeper on that mm -hmm. question, I think you, you started to hint at this in the beginning of your question, but I think some of the things that you start to talk about in your book are around the ways in which a lot of young people, um, even though I think we have the sense that young people we hoped would sort of meet people who were different from themselves yeah. uh, through the internet and learn about different cultures, that in fact that's not so much what you found in some of your work. I think, you know, one of the places where I saw it to be most heartbreaking and challenging has to do with um, LGBT identified youth. So, you know, when I was growing up, uh, the internet was a place where you came out. It was a place where you made sense of your identity. It was a place where you got support. Even, you know, I grew up in rural Pennsylvania, and for me, it was just an amazing place to meet other queer identified folk and try to make sense of what I was experiencing and understanding about myself. Um, and that was really common, and in fact, so much so that we saw this decline in suicide rates with young people who were coming out online with, uh, as they were working out their sexuality. So one of the things is that I started to imagine that when I would go back into the field that I would see this massive decline, that these uh, queer youth would have found amazing amounts of support. And what I found is that the moral panic that really occurred in the 2004-2005 uh, period had you know, been so successful at telling young people that strangers are dangerous that I kept talking to these you know, LGBT-identified youth who 
they would get beaten up at school. They'd be, you know, kicked out of their homes. They'd be going through miserable situations in their in their home home community. Um, and then they would, you know, I would say, "Well, did you find community online?" And they were like, "Oh no, danger! You know, strangers are dangerous. Like I can't talk to strangers." And I was like, oh, "Wait, your home life is, is, has reached a point of danger. Why are we going to this other moment?" And um, the place where I'm still struggling with it, and this is data that I'm still working through, and I'm, I'm hoping that some folks will be able to help me figure out. Um, was that um, there was a moment where Dan Savage came out with a campaign of It Gets Better. Um, and I saw all of these young people who were experiencing pretty horrible things in their home communities create It Gets Better videos, hoping that community would come to them, hoping that they would get support and validation and love. And of course, what ended up happening is they made these videos, they put them up on YouTube, um, and rather than finding their, their peeps online, they just ended up getting attacked more in their home environment. Um, and I tracked a whole slew of reported um, LGBT-identified youth who died by suicide in the year after and found how many of them had kept making those videos. And I just, I'm really struggling with the implications of that. And I'm really struggling with the fact that we've spent so much time in that stranger danger mode without appreciating the value of connecting to people, especially for youth who are really marginalized. So I want to come back to talking a bit more about moral panics. We've, you've touched on them in talking about some of the predator panics that we had in 2004 and 2005. I think we both saw in, our, in all of our work that it really moved into being about um, a fear around cyberbullying and peer-related harms. Can you unpack for us sort of where, where should we be worried and where should we not be worried? Where are these panics in some ways justified? And, and can you talk a little bit, I think, for the audience about what a moral panic really is? Right. So let's start with the online sexual uh, predator moral panic. There was this image that got created, um, and uh, news media did not help, that there was this 40-something-year-old, usually a white male, who would reach out from the computer and grab a child and do terrible things to them. Right? And this was the image that kept you know, playing out. Um, but when you actually looked at sexual crimes against children that had any connection with the internet, this was not what played out. So first off, you'd hear these numbers, like one in seven kids have been sexually solicited online, or one in five was the first number, one in seven was a couple years later. This is actually based on amazing research from a colleague of ours, David Finkelkor, at the Crimes Against Children Research Center. What people don't realize when they just hear that number, they imagine that one in seven children have been you know, grabbed by some 40-something. You know, actually, almost all of that number are sexual solicitations by peers many of which people don't think of as problematic at all, but even those which are dealt with as problematic are mostly peers. Those that aren't peers are almost always 18 to 24. The number who are above that age are such a slim minority. So that's one way of looking at it. The, sort of another more important way is actual crimes against children. What are the sexual crimes that occur um, involving the internet? And again, this is, this is small numbers compared to what we see in terms of sexual crimes uh, that have nothing to do with the internet. But even those that take place involving the internet are pretty consistent in their pattern. They are teenagers who often portray themselves as older, um, engage in sexual interactions online, uh, meet up with an older guy who is usually honest about his age, um, meet up knowing it's for sex, and do so repeatedly, saying that they are in love. Right? Now, when you dive deeper, there's a lot of reasons why this is problematic. There is a reason why statutory rape is, is, a, is a law in this land. Um, but what happens is that these young people are themselves usually facing abuse at home, addiction issues, mental health issues, a variety of things that are going on. What that moral panic is is that it shifts us away from the realities of what goes on and says this idea that all kids are vulnerable. Actually, there are young people who are deeply, deeply in trouble. And what has happened with the internet is it made visible a lot of this, but rather than paying attention, we've diverted our attention to thinking about um, you know, children who in many ways are not in trouble. And rather than addressing or fixing the problems, we get into this mo moment where we're like, oh, we'll just age segregate the population, which has all of these other unintended consequence consequences. And so I think it's really frustrating to me because there are you know, young people who are deeply hurting. Now let's also go back to that sexual solicitation issue. If we want to deal with um, sexual victimization of young people, we have to account for the fact that most sexual victimization that young people will face will be at the hands of their peers. And we don't talk about that at all. We don't talk about how to deal with the fact that your classmate may be the person who will rape you. And how do we actually deal with that or have those hard conversations? Instead, it's a lot easier to go after and rally and block the technology or ban it for what are, in many ways, mythical uh, understandings of what happens and what goes on online. That's great. 
So I want to talk a little bit also about the term addiction. You have a whole chapter with this as the title. And I think you and I share a sentiment that, that perhaps that's not an appropriate way of talking about what's really going on, particularly with young people and the internet. But can you talk a little bit more about, about addiction and technology? Sure. Um, so this all started where I kept hearing this, this notion that, you know, the, these technologies, especially the phone devices, like, it's just like they're just this addicting object that people just want to spend all their days in. Um, and I thought it was really intriguing because what I found as I talked to young people is that when their computers stopped connecting to the internet or when their um, you know, phones uh, you know, ran out of, of um, uh, minutes in, in that period of time, uh, all of a sudden these objects became totally uninteresting. So what was it about the internet? What I realized is it wasn't the internet per se, but the ability to connect to one's friends. And what you started to see is that young people, you know, when we're talking about this narrative, by and large, what young people want to do is spend all of their time with their friends. Um, and there's a whole variety of reasons in which young people's unstructured time with their friends has really, you know, is, is gone um, today compared to what it was even 30 years ago. And so this sort of fascinating dynamic of young people who are deeply drawn to anything that will allow them to connect to their friends. Now, does that mean that some people have unhealthy relationships with their friends? Oh, yeah. Young people have often struggled with these dynamics of, of how important it is to be cool, the questions of popularity, the questions of status. That is nothing new, and that plays out fully online. Likewise, you will see people who you know, are looking to escape, um, and they're looking to escape in ways that, you know, for which entertainment is a complete you know, delight. Um, and one of the things you will see with gaming is this, this desire to escape, particularly in households or communities where there's tremendous amounts of stress or pressure. But I think part of what's challenging is that we again go back to the technology as the thing rather than looking at the underlying dynamics, the explanations of what's going on. And my invitation to people you know, with that chapter is to step away from this frame that so heavily focuses on the technology and appreciate what are the complexities and challenges of young people's lives that make the ability or desire to connect um, so desirable. That's great. Um, there's another term that I'm not a big fan of um, that you also talk about in your book, but um, that I, I also would love to hear you unpack more. Uh, it's the term digital natives. It gets <laughs> thrown around and it's, you know, that, that young people are in fact somehow inherently have a great understanding, a natural, a natural affiliation with the internet, and that all older adults are immigrants who can't possibly fully understand the, the world of technology in the same way that, that young people do. And I think you problematize this, <laughs> this uh, kind of concept. And I think I'd love to hear for you to hear yeah. you talk about it. You know, I, when I was working on this project, one of my uh, friends and collaborators, John Palfrey, he decided that he was going to work hard to reclaim digital natives. And that if he reclaimed it, he could help people appreciate that what it meant to be a part of uh, a generation for which technology was a part of the life meant that people could um, would be willing to engage with and, and understand that this is a part of their world. And what happened is that he ended up becoming a tool in media dialogues that basically misinterpreted his, his attempts to critique, his attempts to problematize, his, his attempts to, to reclaim the concept. And so I sort of came back to, to John and I was like, I think you lose. I think <laughs> we need to actually just say that this, this term is, is a terrible one and move on. The reason why is that you know, another colleague and collaborator of ours, um, Esther Hargitay, uh, wrote this beautiful piece where she um, asked the question, you know, digital natives or digital naives? Um, because she'd been doing large scale survey work with um, uh, freshmen in college as well as, as younger cohorts that showed that um, today's youth are really unsophisticated at very basic technical capacities. Everything from how to uh, architect a search query um, to understanding how to manipulate key parts of, of technology, things that we take for granted. You know, for you know, my generation of kids who were sort of coming online, we had to do a lot to figure out the technology in order to get the devices to work, right? We had to get very innovative. Um, you know, even if we didn't build our own computers, we, it wasn't like our parents understood how to connect the modem up. So we did a lot where we were trying to make it work. And you know, of course, you know, I, my first $700 phone bill that my mother you know, was deeply horrified by meant that I had to find a way to you know, get it so that um, my mother wasn't the one getting charged for it, which you know, in, in great teenage logic meant that I had to figure out how to give the bill to somebody else, you know, and, and thus was figuring out the culture of freaking. Um, and we start to see these moments of, of actually understanding the technology in order to uh, participate in it. 
when these technologies went mainstream, uh, it's great that young people did less illegal things that were not necessarily the better, uh, smartest ideas of my teenage years. But what it means is that they're very able to use you know, whatever the popular social media is to connect with their friends, but they have no understanding of how these systems are architected, um, the logics behind them, the ways in which an algorithm works. The, even something as simple as the biases of what happens with the, you know, the stream of Facebook content where you're not sure what's popping up at the top. That doesn't mean they're not experimenting. That doesn't mean they're not trying to figure it out. But they don't have some magical you know, knowledge just because they're of a particular age cohort. And what is frustrating to me is that we've used these frames of digital natives not just to you know, hold up young people as somehow you know, magically empowered, but to remove the responsibility of adults to help educate young people about the technologies that are shaping our world. Um, and so I think that this becomes deeply frustrating to me because I actually think that we need technical literacy, critical you know, digital literacies, media literacies more now than ever. And yet we have totally you know, removed ourselves of that responsibility in light of the fact that these kids seem to understand technology better than we do. And I think that that is societally irresponsible. Yeah. I mean, I think there are still a subset of, of kids who are very into technology, who know about it, who understand it. But that's not, that is not by far and away, at least according to some of the internet data that we've got, that's not by far and away the vast majority of kids. And in that way, it's like, you know, that was similar to you know, my cohort, where there was a handful of us who were really deeply engaged. And I'll say, you know, one of the things I've noticed about the young people who are really technically engaged is that, let's be honest, they're actually causing as much trouble as my cohort did. Um, and I, I spent a lot of time hanging out with uh, young people who are part of 4chan. Um, for those who don't know what 4chan is, don't look it up. Um, read the Wikipedia entry, it'll be much safer. Um, but it basically is the underbelly of the internet. And what's so phenomenal about it is that it's people who are really trying to um, you know, manipulate the system. So my cohort spent their teenage years trying to hack the security economy, to hack into major um, you know, government apparatus. This cohort really grew up trying to hack the attention economy. And that meant trying to figure out how to position information in ways that would mess with people. And my favorite of which, um, in light of the moral panics that we've talked about, um, was uh, you know, a group of, of young people on 4chan who decided that um, Oprah Winfrey was spending too much time um, you know, getting, her, you know, getting so upset about all things Predator. Um, so they decided that they would try to punk her by getting her to talk about how all of these predators were coming and they were going to attack all of us. And they filled her forums with all this information. And sure enough, she did an entire special on this mythical predation story that these um, teenagers had created. And they were all proud of themselves. Right? And they, you know, not only did they do that, they, they hacked Time Magazine's top 100 list just to prove that they could. You know, and we saw this happen in the mid-2000s. And then you know, things started getting a lot more serious uh, politically. Uh, WikiLeaks occurred. Um, sure enough, we've seen you know, summer of surveillance, uh, which many people in this room have been deeply involved in. And all of a sudden, these, these 4chan kids who had spent so much time hacking the attention economy suddenly switched. And we saw the birth of what is anonymous with a capital A. We saw a lot of political activism. And we are seeing a whole dynamic of um, whistleblowing as civil disobedience. So there is this amazing cohort of young people who did build technical chops trying to figure out how to work within these systems really through a level of interest. But we should not assume that they are at all you know, mainstream or the, the community writ large. And I want to actually talk a little bit about political activism, because you do touch on that a little bit towards the very end of the book, in which I, I, I think you make some points around um, how, first of all, that young people are often not seen as politically active. Um, but I think your example that you've just given us here today through this participation through 4chan and through technological means of political activism, that young people are in fact engaging in political activism. Yeah, the, you know, there are young people, and this is in the same ways the technical issue as well, which is that there are young people who are politically motivated and technology becomes a tool which, which they can enact that. And what's been phenomenal to watch over, over these different periods is how young people will get creative with the tools that are at hand to try to engage their, their peers. But this doesn't always go well. And this is one of the things that I think is really fascinating because we talk you know, abstractly about how we want young people to be politically engaged, but no, not that way, right? It's usually the sort of double-handed remark. And I watched this in particular in light of um, what was happening around immigration reform uh, in, in the US. 
So there was a, a bill that came up, um, HR, HR 4437. I love the titles of things in this town that make them so oddly memorable in weird ways. Um, and this was a question about uh, you know, how we would think about immigration and it would, the implications would play out pretty significantly pr um, for undocumented um, youth and their families. And so I started to see um, a lot of um, Latino uh, young people trying to galvanize and engage over this bill. Um, and at the time, uh, Spanish-speaking radio was really activating a lot of adults for a protest in May of, I'm going to blank on the year, so forgive me. Um, but they were trying to you know, activate uh, all of these adults. And young people went, hey, what about us? And many of them were actually documented youth of undocumented parents. So they were really struggling with their, their cross position. And so they used, at the time, MySpace to try, figure out that they could actually spread messages and try to get people to repost things and try to connect people to engage in a moment of activism. And indeed, they managed to get a word out about a protest that they wanted to stage on a Monday morning uh, where they wanted everybody to walk out of school at, I think it was at 9 AM or whatever. And they did. Um, and thousands of young people across um, Western states, uh, and particularly California, uh, walked out um, in protest, and they, they took over um, in Los Angeles, they took over uh, the highways and blocked traffic, and they you know, managed to get themselves in the media. But rather than it being narrated as this is this wonderful thing of seeing young people being you know, actively engaged, it was this terrible thing of young people skipping out on school. They didn't even know what they were doing or what they were standing up for. They were just using this as an excuse. And of course, if you know anything about California politics, schools are docked money um, every day for, the day for a child being absent. So there was a political interest from the school districts for um, the problem of young people having left school because it meant a loss of money for them. But what was hardest to watch was Mayor Villagosa, who responded to this situation by saying, Cesar Chavez would be ashamed of you. Um, that how dare you? you, you, you are in this country to get an education. Um, and it was a really intense situation because young people were like, you want us to be engaged and you don't want us to be engaged? Well, I don't understand. And it was a very fair question. And it's something that I think will continue to pop up because young people's activism, what makes it powerful and makes it effective is also what makes it absolutely terrifying to the powers that be. Because it means using tactics to get attention that are not necessarily what are de determined to be normative or acceptable tactics, right? It means pushing boundaries. But that is fundamentally what activism is about. And I see these tensions that emerge when young people do engage in activism because they usually use tools in new ways that adults hadn't previously thought about. So I want to talk about attention as well. I want to come back to this idea of the attention economy. I think you've brought it up. Um, I've heard other people obviously talking about it. Um, we see the internet as this thing, right? That, that the economy, the currency of the internet is attention. What, uh, do, how much do adolescents and teens really have a sense that they are participating in an attention economy? That they, are there ways in which they're trying to game the system that they understand? Do they understand from, from your experience how much they're being both watch? Do they understand the ways in which corporations are um, at work um, in, in how they present themselves and, and uh, observing how they present themselves online? You know, so Chris Hufnagel out of Berkeley has done these amazing surveys um, trying to understand whether young people are more sophisticated about um, you know, different aspects of surveillance, corporate you know, uses, um, marketing data and whatnot, has found that by and large young people are as sophisticated as adults, which is to say not very. Um, and that, uh, generally speaking, I found that to be true. But one of the things that I found when I talked to teenagers about this is they were like, look, this is our one place where we can hang out with our friends. Great, it's commercial. It's the one place where we can go. What do you want us to do? And there was a, you know, a fair response to that you know, you know, frustration of just like, yeah, it's capitalist. You, you, you want to have a problem with it? Raise a problem with capitalism. Like, this, is, this is not our fight. This is our place where we want to get together with our friends. That said, young people are aware of you know, different aspects of how their data is being watched. Some of those are accurate. Some of those are inaccurate. They're most deeply concerned about people who hold immediate power over them. This is parents, teachers, college admissions officers, military recruiters, um, you know, local law enforcement. That's who they're concerned about because that's who they see in an immediate way. Corporations, government writ large, they don't feel like they have anything that can make a difference in this. That said, they love mucking with the data just for fun. Um, and that's actually where I see you know, a moment of resistance that I think is really beautiful. Sometimes it's just to play with one's friends. So you know, 
I, uh, I love this example. I was sitting down with a teenage boy, and um, Gmail is one of the few things that doesn't get blocked in a lot of American schools because uh, Google ends up being useful for other reasons, and so they don't block it whole. And so, you know, I'd find these teenagers who, during the day, would use Gmail not because it was their preferred communication choice, but because it worked. Um, and so I was sitting down with this boy, and he was um, trying to send uh, messages to his friend in school. And he wanted his friends to get inappropriate advertisement just because just it was funny, right? And so he you know, would write these messages out, and he would you know, make them in white text so that they would be seen as invisible just to get his friends to get diapers ads. Because nothing is funnier to a 15-year-old than diapers ads, right? Um, you know, and this way of being aware enough about advertising culture in order to play with it, that doesn't necessarily mean a sense of empowerment. Another place where I saw this pop up has to do with um, uh, Facebook, um, which is that whether they were right or wrong, and I could never confirm it from the company, young people had figured out or believed themselves to have figured out that if you put brand names in your posts, they would appear at the top of the news feed. So you know, you'd write like la 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 la, whatever you want, and then you'd add Nike to it, just in the hopes that maybe somebody would actually see it. And it's that moment of awareness, that moment of recognizing the algorithms, even if you don't understand them, even if you don't understand what actually works, where you start to see this just you know, peripheral sensibility that it's happening. That doesn't mean young people feel necessarily a sense of power or ability to change it. At the end of the day, what they're more worried about is, is mom than anything else. Um, because mom, you know, even when she's well intended, intended um, tends to misinterpret nearly everything that is seen. Um, and that is where the points of frustration become you know, really real. And I think that's, that's exactly what we, and you and I have talked about this a lot in terms of really focusing not just even on attention, but on concepts of privacy. Um, the concerns that youth have, I think, I mean, w what I think would sum up at least our findings, and I think your findings as well, is that kids care about privacy just not in the same way that adults do. Yeah. Um, they're not worried about the same institutions. They're worried about mom. And so, you know, to delve more specifically into privacy, we've talked about it a little bit, but, you know, what are some of the tensions that teens face about privacy online? What are some of their practices around online privacy that you saw? You know, in the early days of social media, Parents weren't paying attention. They hadn't figured any of this stuff out. And so uh, what ended up happening is I, you know, their content online was completely legible to me because they were completely upfront about what they were talking about. And over the decade in which I was doing the work, um, really the thing that was most noticeable in a shift is that young people became much more sophisticated about realizing that their audiences were much broader than they wanted them to be. Um, and in particular, it, it didn't matter how much you knew about the privacy settings. All it took was for mom to look over your shoulder at home, uh, and that would undermine anything you had done within a system. So young people started doing all of these sort of more sophisticated you know, techniques, trying to control you know, how you know, the, the social situations in which they operated. And that's where it's important to note, it wasn't just about the control of information, it was control of social situations. So it was in control of, of the interpretation, not just the data itself. And indeed, one of the most significant shifts I saw was that rather than trying to control access to content or trying to you know, restrict access to content, what young people started to do was try to restrict access to meaning, to make certain that you had to be in the know to understand what you saw online. And I give this through a case in the book, which I think was, is just beautifully illustrative of this um, dynamic, although you know, we've talked and there's been a lot more practices that are much more mundane. But this is illustrative, especially for sort of a geeky uh, um, identified crowd, um, which is that this, I met this young woman named Carmen. She's of Argentinian descent, which is important for this uh, story. She knew that her mother would not recognize British cultural references, let alone geeky references. Um, and she uh, wanted to convey something to her friends without upsetting her mother. The challenge with it is that she's found over time, when she writes something that's emo or emotional, her mother tended to overreact um, in deeply problematic ways. So she and her boyfriend had broken up, and she wanted to tell all of her friends what was going on so that she could get sympathy and love and support and validation. Um, and so she wanted to post a song lyric that would sort of express her emotions online. If you haven't spent time with teenagers, song lyrics are the best way to you know, express all forms of emotion. You just need to find the perfect one. Um, and so rather than posting something that was really sappy or depressing, which would of course trigger her mother's, uh, you know, uh, into thinking she was suicidal, it had happened before and it was deeply frustrating, she decided instead to post a song lyric from Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. Now for those who don't know the Monty Python reference, this is a song sung during the life of Brian in which the key character is being crucified. There is nothing happy about this scene at all. Um, but what happens is her mother immediately jumps on and says, it looks like you're having a great day. And her friends immediately text her, right? 
because the song lyrics seem so happy, and yet it's telling a much more complex story to the people who understand what's going on. You know, and we've talked over the years because a lot of this happens at all of these different layers. We're starting to hear language like subtweeting. We hear you know, all of these different sophisticated ways of encoding things by using pronouns where you really have to be local. Now, that's one of the ways in which to use you know, the sort of social dynamics. But there's actually also technical ways in which people do things that you would never expect with the technology. You know, one of my favorite examples is actually from here in DC. Um, for those who don't work with, foster, with youth in foster care, um, when you're in, uh, you know, when you're a guardian of the state, that means you're, the state is your guardian. Um, and there's a lot of pressure in those situations for um, the state to get access to your online ma ma materials. And this one woman I met here in town was frustrated because every time she would go into um, uh, the office uh, for, for different kinds of um, support or in the transitions um, regarding fo her foster families, um, she would be forced to log into Facebook, and she was just frustrated with it. So she decided she'd had enough of it, she was going to be done with Facebook. Now, if you've tried to delete your Facebook account, you'll find that they guilt you, right? You don't really want to you know, delete your account. Look at all the people that will be so sad. You won't be there, and there's all these things you'll miss out. You don't have to do it. You can just deactivate your account. So she got an idea, and she deactivated her account, and the next day, she logged in, she reactivated her account. She was on it for two hours, she deactivated her account. The next day she logged in, she reactivated her account, then she deactivated. And she'd do this every day. And what she found was that she could turn Facebook into a real-time activity. And that when any, anybody would search for her at any other time, for all intents and purposes, she wasn't on the site. She didn't exist. People couldn't send her messages, people couldn't ask her for things, and she could play as though she knew nothing about the site. And it was a really funny moment because I said to her, I said, well, you know, what happens if somebody happens to be searching, you know, when you're logged in at the same time? And she's like, they only look from like, you know, nine to six. I only log in after seven, right? She's like, no, no adult actually, you know, deals with it then. And whether or not she's right doesn't matter. What points out is that she's trying to control that context. She's trying to control that social situation. And what I kept running into was all of these young people working within the dynamics of their particular community, trying to achieve privacy by any means possible in light of the people that hold power over them. That's great. So you talked at the beginning um, and have talked, I think, at length at times about the ways in which the internet had this wonderful sort of expansive feeling for you and this expansive opportunity yeah. for you um, when you were growing up. Do you think that that exists for the majority of kids today? Is that something that kids, that some kids can achieve, that no kids can achieve based on the ways in which we as a society are parenting youth and the ways in which this technology kind of operates and works upon them? No, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's been really challenging for me to make sense of parenting culture in America because there's so much stress, so much pressure so many anxieties that are projected onto youth and that youth have to experience and, and navigate. There is no doubt that there are some young people who find a way to be free in spite of it all. Um, but it's really hard. And I, I think I'm thinking about um, a conversation that I had with a mother um, who she really wanted her daughter to have freedom. She wanted her daughter to be allowed to roam free. She, saw, she thought that this whole culture of fear was, was deeply problematic. And she was bound to let her you know, daughter have complete reins on the internet, literally be able to go out and bike in her community. It was no big deal. What she found was that her daughter stopped being invited to birthday parties. Her sto daughter stopped being invited to be a part of other families' households. And it was part of this problem where her daughter was then seen as this wild child who was deeply dangerous um, and would be a bad influence on other kids' um, children, or other parents' children. And so she found herself putting in restrictions on her daughter's behavior so that her daughter wouldn't be seen in this way by her peers. And it made me really sad to see that because one of the challenges in, in all of these dynamics is that we're dealing with a collective action problem. This is not about a particular decision of a parent. This is about a dynamic within a broader community. And this is one of the things is that even if your child is able to go out and roam, if she's got nowhere to go, if nobody there to hang out with, she's not particularly interested in doing so. And so I, I really struggle with it. I think I struggle with how to navigate this world because you know, this isn't about you know, all of these individual parents making decisions, but coming together and saying that actually for the health of our society, we need young people to be a part of public life. We need young people to have a lot more freedom than we currently give them. Um, and I don't, I, mean, I don't know how to solve that problem. And I think part of the goal of the book is to 
to try to at least start that conversation. Uh, how effective I'll be, that I don't know. Yeah. Help the pendulum swing back. Yeah, I hope so. Well, I've asked a lot of questions. Um, and so I think Mary is going to help us uh, figure out, I don't know if you have any questions, Mary, you want to ask, or if we want to just throw it open to the crowd to ask uh, their own questions. Yeah, I think let's open it up to the crowd. We have a microphone here. That we, we are live around. streaming, so yeah, yeah so be so aware of that. that. <laughs> um, and then um, certainly um, if others don't have questions, I'll jump in. Hi, my name's Dave Price. I work with uh, urban school systems all up and down the East Coast. Uh, real quickly, a, a comment, an observation, and then a question, uh, a request. Could you quit writing books and quit speaking of politics and prose in here and just come with me? <laughs> and I think we could make some really good changes in education, because I, 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 that wasn't the whole purpose of your talk. Um, secondly, the observation, when I was a teenager, Lyndon uh, Baines Johnson was president, so it was a while ago. But it was a very similar situation. I don't know if anyone in the room remembers. They were called slam books. Mm -hmm. And you would write all that stuff in there. And that's really all much of youth Facebook is. And of course, it's, it's made much more. But my serious question is this. If you were to address a room full of educators today, uh, one of the things that you find in education is tremendous hypocrisy. Um, first of all, they talk about technology and then don't let the kids use it, uh, or at least use it the way they intend. Uh, secondly, they're very fearful of it, and understandably so. I mean, if someone is looking at porn, and they go home and tell their mother, and then there's a lawsuit, et cetera, et cetera. But if you had three pieces, or you could take four or two, some small number, um, that based on your talking to young people, who are the experts in it, that would improve their educational experience in terms of technology and schools. I'd appreciate if you'd do that. Right. I mean, the number one thing, but you know this, is more funding for schools. <laughs> um, you know. Early on in the days, early days of social media, and particularly MySpace, was before we reached this point where teachers were told that they shouldn't interact with young people on social technologies. And I saw some really phenomenal things happen during that period. Um, and, I, and I give a case in the book of um, uh, a teacher that I met um, who uh, he had, had a profile on MySpace, and his, his, he had created this dynamic where his students could friend him, and he was not going to you know, invade their space at all. But if they invited him and they talked to him, he would, he would allow it. And um, one of his students comes onto his MySpace and leaves a comment. Is like, you know, yo, Mr. C, like, why am I learning this trigonometry stuff? Like, you know, when am I ever going to use this? My mom doesn't know it. She doesn't need it. Like, what is this? Why are you making a big deal out of this? And he responds by saying, you know, the reason we teach Shakespeare or trigonometry or all of these other things is because we're trying to help you think. And here, and he basically goes into a metapedagogical conversation. And all of these students pile on and they start this discussion. And what ends up happening is, is that you know, in this very working class you know, California school, it changes the dynamics for the next month of what happens in school. And they're much more willing to listen to him rather than just sort of writing him off. And it was this amazing moment of change. Likewise, in that period, I saw teachers um, be able to see when young people are really struggling um, and in different ways and take that into that environment. I think the saddest thing that I've seen is that this whole idea of like any teacher who interacts with a young person outside of the classroom is inherently a predator, um, resulting in the idea that we should never allow young people to um, talk to uh, teachers. And I think this is really sad because we actually need an environment where um, it's not that teachers are teachers always, but that they are respected parts of our communities um, and that they are allowed to be present. Um, and so the very functional advice that I give, especially to principals and to, and to teachers and principals in schools is create, you know, ignore Facebook's terms of service. Create an account that is purely you, know, you as teacher on whatever is the popular social media of, of your um, teen's cohort. And don't friend a student because that's sketchy. Um, but if they come to you, be willing to be present. And if you see something that bothers you, don't throw a fit in that context. Just be <coughs> the next time you see the student, be like, I'm here. You know that. And if you are worried about it, turn your password over to your principal. Make it an open door policy. Be present. So I think that this is one of the things that I think is important is that many educators are in there because they love students. They want to support them. They really want them to, to grow up and be a part of society. And I think we need to encourage that. Of course, I realize that this is a burden. So I don't think this is a matter of you know, for every teacher, because it's exhausting. That's one thing's functional. Second thing is, is that many of the schools that I've seen um, will not talk about social technologies to young people who are too young to use them, even though they know every student in their middle school is actually on them. 
Um, I actually think that this does a disservice to things. I think we just have to acknowledge that young people are participating in these environments and that these conversations need to happen. That we need um, middle school youth to become critically engaged with these environments, even if they're not using them, to be aware of it. And it's about starting to ask questions, not demanding practices. Um, and I think that becomes you know, a challenge for me. Um, and I say this in light of the fact that, you know, especially in this town, we spend a lot of time with how deeply problematic, ineffective, um, and long-term damaging the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act has been, even in light of the fact that it is so well-intended. Um, and so I, th I struggle with that, because I want to see privacy protections you know, deeply within the society, but that's not the law that gets us there. Um, in terms of a third thing to you know, engage educators on, I think um, part of it is, is you know, realizing that you're never going to be the experts of every aspect of students' life. And it's about how do you ask the hard questions of them and engage them on the variety of other social dynamics that are going on, not just the formal education structures and give them the, the tools to ask critical questions of uh, what's going on. All that said, I think that teachers are in a very hard place, especially in today's society. Um, and I, I have an amazing appreciation for the hard work that they do. And I really struggle to ask them to do more, um, in spite of the fact that I would love them to do more. But I think it's, I think it's hard. We undervalue teachers. We don't recognize and support their, their challenging position. And yet we need them now more than ever. And I'd be happy to talk to you about engaging more generally. <laughs> we will. Um, hi, my name is Ariane Higovich. I'm from the Institute for Women's Policy Research. Um, I thought this was absolutely fascinating. Um, and the, the, I guess the emphasis on saying, you know, kids are kids and they just have a new medium. And if they're problems, they're really problems that are outside the internet. But I'm just wondering whether your emphasis on debunking the dangers or the independent influence of the internet underplays the new influence of the internet. Because say, if you take bullying, um, having the venue of the internet strengthens what you can do. Um, and also, even though, yes, kids now, you know, they can't congregate somewhere else, so they congregate on the internet. Does it not also change in some way the way they interact? So I'm just wondering, sure. you know, the the kind of pendulum to, sure. to swing back a little bit of how it might change issues. So I'm going to take up bullying first, and I think bullying is one of those challenging issues because what we mean by it differs. Now, the thi first thing to recognize is that academics and people, real people, never have the same definition for things. So when it happens, it's kind of a miracle. And one of the most shocking things to me that I found was that teenagers' understandings of bullying actually more mirrored um, academics' understandings of bullying than the p adults' narratives of bullying. Now, let me explain that. Academics have long defined bullying very concretely as psychological, physical, or social aggression repeated over time by people of differential physical or social power. This is the big kid picking on the little kid. This is the cool kid picking on the, on the geek. This kind of dynamic. This is actually how young people understand bullying. And they talk about other forms of meanness and cruelty through a variety of other language. Um, and the thing that I think is important of that is that adults, on the other hand, use the term bullying to refer to every aspect of meanness and cruelty, from lightweight teasing to serious criminal harassment. And the kinds of interventions that we need across every aspect of that are different. So let's take that narrow definition of bullying that we, we can have, and because we have an amazing amount of research on it. Over the last 30 years, if you stabilize that definition, there has been no rise in bullying. This is completely shocking to people who see the media narratives of it. More phenomenally is that when you talk to young people today, and there's been phenomenal surveys that have done this, um, young people continuously report that bullying is worse in school, happens more frequently, and with greater emotional duress. Right? And that's pretty astonishing to think about in light of the more complex picture. Now let's talk about meanness and cruelty, because there's a whole host of meanness and cruelty that piles onto the internet that has nothing to do with what we would think of as bullying. Um, and there is un undoubtedly a lot of this is much more visible. And what I struggled with as I watched young people doing this is they use a lot of language that emotionally distance themselves from the, the hurtfulness of it. And you'll hear this in a gender dynamic of, of drama amongst girls, prank, pranking and punking amongst boys. And it's a way of saying, going from this doesn't really bother me to this hurts a lot, but I don't want to see myself as a victim. 
So the language of bullying positions somebody as a perpetrator and somebody as a victim, whereas the language of drama allows people to escape a lot of that. And that becomes really phenomenal to see. So how much does the internet make a lot of this worse? What's challenging to untangle in all of this is that there is a lot of meanness and cruelty that is much more visible in every aspect of American society today than it was 30 years ago. It starts with this town, right? I, I woke up this morning listening to Ted Cruz, um, you know, going off and yelling and talking terrible things about people. And that is performed as our news channels on every TV station out there. Meanness and cruelty for sport and politics. It is the way in which we talk about entertainment, this is reality TV, is a form of constant meanness and cruelty. What killed me is that I would go into parents' homes and they would talk about how bullying was a terrible thing by which they meant all aspects of meanness and cruelty while sitting there talking uh, poorly about their bosses and colleagues at work, not realizing that they were uh, setting in motion a way of, of being negative towards other people. And so this is challenging for me because all of this pours out online. All of this aspect of meanness and cruelty that has become so normalized in every aspect of society. And I'm not convinced that it's really young people or the technology that's making that happen. I think it's our society. And I really want to step back and deal with that. Now, to your, to your broader point about you know, how are certain things of this getting you know, more challenging and, and like what's, what's really different. There's no doubt that the process of learning to read facial expressions, the process of, of interacting face to face, is so different than, than learning to do textual media. Right? That's a very different dynamic. It, the thing that kills me is that it's not that teenagers prefer the textual media. It's that they don't have the opportunity for the face to face. So if we want to address that, we have to deal with that dynamic. That said, there's some amazing moments of how young people are using textual media to engage in ways that they may not previously have been willing to engage. So I'm on the board of a service called Crisis Text Line, um, which is a texting hotline for young people who are in crisis to talk to counselors, trained counselors. And part of it was responding to a world of, of you know, suicide hotlines and the decline of um, young people's participation in them in light of the fact that young people were uh, really struggling in this country, and you know, not to mention the lack of mental health support, um, the lack of you know, uh, social services. And what we started up was the ability for young people to text to counselors. And what we found pretty quickly is that young people were willing to get to the point of what was going on in their lives much faster through text than through any other medium. And without any advertisement, we've been slowly rolling out over the last six months. We are at over 100,000 text conversations between young people and counselors um, per month uh, in, um, in, in, over every topic from coming out to you know, different aspects of meanness and cruelty to suicide ideology. And it's pretty phenomenal to see this moment of when text can be more powerful. And I'm not to say that the, the internet is, not, is the answer to things. I don't think it is. I think we need to get much more back into physical environments. But I don't think that we can blame technology as pushing us there. I think that we really have to account for what we're doing as a society as a whole. And if we don't like the society we're living in, we have to fix it rather than starting to blame the artifacts of it. Um, so we actually have a question from the Twitters. Um, <laughs> Derek Moore asks, how globally applicable are the insights from It's Complicated for Teens outside the USA? Um, the short answer is I don't know. Um, the long answer is everybody keeps telling me that it's, it's more applicable than I, I give it credit for. Um, so I purposely decided to do this project looking at the US and its, its constructs and its constraints, in part because I knew this country. I'd spent a lot of time in 49 different states long before I did this, this work. And so I had a sense of the dynamics, and I felt like I could actually make sense of it. I spoke the language, which helps a lot. Um, I understood the cultural references. And so my field work, you know, which crosses 16 different states for this project, is very squarely rooted in this environment. That said, I have amazing colleagues around, around the globe. And I've spent a lot of time talking to them. So Sonia Livingstone, who you know, we all spend a lot of time with, um, does a phenomenal work in the EU, um, working with a variety of different researchers um, across the EU and doing comparative studies. Um, and we found amazingly similar patterns on things that we could line up. Um, and there's some obviously some differences um, in ways that are pretty obvious in Europe. The UK is a lot more like the US than, say, Italy. Um, and like when I spend time in Italy, I'm always amazed to see young people out in, in public squares. I'm like, wow, that's fascinating. 
Um, and you know, likewise, you see it in, in certain Asian contexts. I have friends down in Australia where the, the politics down there have gotten pretty ugly. Um, and we've done a lot of alignment of work, and that stuff aligns pretty well. Obviously, the cultural contours of you know, many Asian societies, many African societies, many South American societies are quite different. So I don't know what applies and what doesn't. Um, and I think part of what I'm looking forward to is, is people actually telling me what works and what doesn't and getting that feedback. Um, but I just don't have the data to speak to you know, uh, the world. Um, that said, I think that a lot of the issues that I raise um, certainly can spark conversations in other contexts. And I'm, I'm sort of fascinated, I should point out that you know, I put this book out there and uh, you know, the first language that it was translated into was British, um, which I thought was fair, <laughs> right? Like, apparently it's, it's easier to add U's and S's than, than to do anything else. So I was, I was like, this is great. Um, so it, it'll be released in British um, on, uh, on Saturday. Um, but the weirder part was that um, the next two languages were the language I was least expecting this to be translated to which was Mandarin and Korean. Um, so this will be translated shortly into Mandarin and Korean, and I'm just like, those are two countries with such a radically different cultural dynamics around this. But then again, I am so looking forward to hearing the critiques and the feedback um, from you know, scholars and researchers in those communities. Um, but so, I just don't know. Um, I hope it, it sparks conversations, but I don't know how applicable. Other questions? So I'm a parenting educator and I've written a book on parenting. So I'm obviously really interested in what your, what your perspectives are on that. And what I find from my research and speaking to parents is um, that they're, they're just as a, a technology obsessed <laughs> as their kids and you know inclined to spend time on, on social media, et cetera. Um, that their kids are acutely aware as teens are of the hypocrisy of what they hear, and they're, you know that they're they're so smart, but that parents are um, in essence at a loss. Um, they're confused, and it's not that they want to want to draw lines in the sand um, and to have to police them. Nobody wants to do that. Um, they just they just don't know how to have the conversation, and so a lot of what I try and talk about in, in my book is how do you have that conversation? What is the right conversation? So I would love to hear from you. It sounds like you did talk to parents and obviously you talked to gazillion kids. What should the conversation sound like yeah. between the parent and the, and the teen? You know, it's, it starts with communication that's long before we're dealing with technology. It starts with making certain that you're building a robust interaction. And it, even before your child is really getting, is of age where they can even interact with the objects, it's about emulating the practices and the dynamics and the values you want within your household. You know, and I, I struggle with this uh, watching you know, parents of small children being like, oh, I'll give up my phone when, you know, when we can have a conversation, right? And it's just like, no, 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 that's not how this works, right? You, you need to be present for your child long before they're verbal. Um, and they're seeing you on this device and they're smart, um, even if they can't communicate what's going on. Um, and that sets in motion a process of like, what is the values of the household? What are the dynamics of the household? And what is it really important to you as it goes beyond that? Um, and this is where I believe that the you know, approach to this is a values-driven one as opposed to a, a, a checklist-driven one. You know, what do we care about? What really matters? What is important? And that questioning um, happens really early on. You know, some of the most phenomenal households that I've seen They've done a lot of this through the process of questioning rather than the process of rules. And I'll you know, think about this in, in terms of, there's an amazing um, anthropologist by the name of um, Jean Briggs who did this book called Inuit Morality Play. And Inuit Morality Play makes no sense in an American context, but it's brilliant as a provocation to think about things, which is the way that young Inuit um, children learn morality is by parents asking completely inappropriate and hard questions. So for example, you know, your son comes up to you and is like, mommy, 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 I hate Bobby, he's mean. And in an American context, we'll be like, it's okay, you know, don't worry about it, you know, like, and, and there's a lot of support. In an Inuit culture, the response will be, well, why don't you kill him, right? And you can't even imagine asking that here. But the thing is, is that he'll look at you and be like, well, I don't hate him that much. <laughs> and he's like, well, how much do you hate him, right? And it becomes this questioning. And in that process of questioning, you realize very quickly that unless you're raising a sociopath, 
your children will be able to respond by sitting there and thinking through boundaries of morality, right? And, and if you get a response of like, great, I have permission to kill this, we're, it's a different issue, right? Like, we'll, we'll deal with that separately. Um, but most of it is starting to ask those questions. And you know, I think that those questions, those ability to look at what's happening online, being like, what makes this so appealing to you? You know, what, what's so cool? What, are you what would make this, this you know, service better for you? And like literally asking questions that are not judgmental, provocative questions, but like, how, like what is awesome about this when you're talking with a 10-year-old? You know, obviously your 16-year-old is gonna be less interested in, in responding to your incessant questioning, but that conversation can happen pretty early on and sets in motion a set of reflexivities that becomes so powerful for thinking about, you know, having that conversation. Because it's not about the conversation, you know. Like for example, even the birds and bees conversation, which is always painful to watch parents be like, I'm going to have that one conversation and then it's all dealt with, right? <laughs> you know, sexuality done, check off. Um, there's, you know, it's a process of awareness and it's a process that will continue on, you know, many years. Um, and I think that's really one of my challenges with regard to helping parents figure out parenting dynamics is that I wish there was a silver bullet. I wish there was a checklist. I wish it was easy. But I think we wouldn't love being parents as much if it was so easy. Part of it is the, you know, the opportunity to you know, learn through our children. And I think we have to respect that and, and think of it and think of technology as part of that broader ecosystem. And think about how we drive everything through values and through our desire to create a healthy community. Hello, my name is Maeve Duggan. I work at Pew Research Center with Mary and Amanda, my lovely colleagues. Um, so as a millennial, I definitely spent my teenage years on AIM and my college years on Facebook and a lot of it revolved around relationships and who likes who and who's talking about what. Uh, and there's also this notion of hookup culture being one of those challenging terms and that the ease of accessibility to highly sexualized images and content and material online has all of a sudden made teens, you know, highly disrespectful of one another and, you know, viewing each other as sexual objects rather than people and human beings with feelings and emotions. So I was wondering if you could speak to what you found with teens about relationships and breakups and all of that good juicy stuff? Um, no, and it's a good question. I think that uh, I'll start with some of the issues around pornography. One of the most startling things that we found um, looking at data over time was that um, the number one correlate for people getting exposed to pornography these days is looking for it, right? And so this is a big difference from when I was online where you accidentally stumbled across pornography all of the time. Uh, because you know, it was part of spam culture, there was a variety of lack of controls, et cetera, et cetera. And now there's a dynamic of looking for it. We live in a sexual image saturated society. Um, it's, you know, whether we're talking about uh, you know, advertisements for major products that are he heavily fo photoshopped, whether we're talking about Miley Cyrus's latest ridiculous video, we, ha we have this holistic world of sexualized images. We don't have an ability as a society to have a conversation about it. And I think it comes back to these birds and bees issues, which is that like, we will ignore the fact that our teenagers might be picking up on the fact that these things are sexualized and we don't want to talk about that and that is uncomfortable. And yet, now more than ever, we need to have a critical conversation about what are the portraits of imagery that we have accepted um, in our society and that become the ideas of beauty and how deeply, deeply problematic that they are. Um, and there are a lot of um, families that I have talked to who have started having that critical conversation as opposed to just a birds and a bees conversation and I think that's really powerful. Um, in terms of hookup culture, one of the things that's funny is that that notion actually comes up about every seven to ten years that this crazy cohort is engaged in so many more hookups now than ever before. Except that when we look at certain measures and markers, it's not entirely clear you know, what's going on. Certain things, for example, um, teenage pregnancy have been on the decline in really significant ways. STI exposure has been you know, in, in decline in certain communities. In other communities, it's on the rise. We have to deal with class politics there. Um, you know, hookups around emotionality and empowerment have, have been a twisted dynamic with regard to females, um, female identities and female sexualities, particularly in heteronormative environments. Um, and I think it, it, it's challenging and it's a big hairball is the, is the short answer. 
I think that the way that we work ourselves out of it is by being able to be more honest as a society about what's going on, the way these images are produced, the way that we use sex as different tools and tactics. And we, we see it portrayed in media, but we don't have a conversation about it. Um, and it's also really challenging to me because of the fact that there is um, so much gets cramped up in those high school years that college becomes this explosion of mess um, in uh, upper middle class American society. Um, and I think that that's a challenge to see in light of all of this because we have done a disservice to young people by not giving them any freedom and then imagining that, that at 18 they go off to college and are perfectly competent of dealing with everything, which I think is terrifying. Um, and so I see it in light of another aspect of things, which is um, the issue of alcohol in this country. And al you know, with my professor hat on, nothing makes me more angry than our alcohol politics. Um, because what happens is that rather than young people learning how to have healthy relationships with this substance when they're at home, they come onto college campus where they're suddenly free. And long before they're 21, um, they're binge drinking um, and getting themselves in all sorts of trouble regarding this, having never been socialized into a healthy relationship to alcohol at all. Um, and colleges are left to deal with it in ways that they're not at all prepared to deal with it. And as, a, as an educator, I just deal with hungover 18-year-olds, right, which is not fun on any level. So I, I, I deal with this in light of all of that, and I think it steps back and thinks about how we recognize that there is no magical age in which people are suddenly mature. Um, and so it's a matter of how you socialize people into a whole variety of things rather than just opening the doors and letting them go free. Um, and I say this in light of the fact that, you know, uh, I've seen this not just with regard to teenagers, but adults who, you know, for example, uh, watch a divorcee use Tinder right now. It's a pretty terrifying thought. Um, and it's this dynamic of how you're dealing with suddenly not being able to deal with issues. So this is, for me, it's like, how do we have a holistic conversation um, about this, these aspects rather than just blaming a generation or a cohort? Um, because I don't think that this is a cohort issue. I think that this is a, uh, a socialized process issue. Hey, uh, Dana, this is Tom Risen with US News World Report. And I'm, I saw you at uh, the Google Internet Liberty Conference uh, I think it was a couple years ago. And uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of the research Pew did uh, yesterday about uh, internet and relationships in society. Um, I'm wondering about, so talking about a uh, holistic approach to socializing people, in your research, did you notice how families give their kids smartphones or get, kind of ease them into using the internet? Like, we've been having, you know, another thing with alcohol, um, cars. Oh, kid teenagers have had access to cars for decades and like, okay, you're too young to have a car, you're too young to drive, you're too young to be on your own. When are we gonna, how is that conversation developing with phones and the internet and we've got like training wheels devices for kids that aren't connected to the internet, you can play around on a little tablet or whatever. How do you see this developing? You know, the thing is right now I think it's in a stage of experimentalism. I don't think that we have a really good track record of understanding all the dynamics of it. It's, you know, at this point with smartphones being pretty pervasive in the upper middle class, what we see is that even at the youngest of years, you know, the, the smartphone is in the hands in, in a family's household with a newborn, right? And it becomes a bright light object. Um, indeed, I say this as somebody who, ha who has my own small child for whom, you know, right now as I'm traveling, the smartphone is understood as mommy in a box, right? And you know, mommy in a box checks in every day um, and says hello, but it's you know, it's not quite the same. Um, when you know, because this object plays a role in parents' life, even small children start to mess with it. Um, and I say this also, having gotten to experience this uh, last week, where I was amazed that a two and a half year old managed to completely hard reset my phone, and I was like, how did you do that, right? Mm -hmm. And this moment of just being willing to pound and play on it. Part of what's fascinating to me is, is that these moments of when that becomes a boundary object or when it becomes a point of enticement, right? Which is just like, oh, you've restricted my access to this thing, now I want it, right? Um, whether it's the knife in the household or the, the smartphone, right? So how do we then deal with these objects in, our house, in the house uh, in a slow process? What's you know, advantageous about introducing technology at a relatively young age is that you can do it in a way that's about a family activity, right? We're going to get together and, you know, 
you're six and we're going to watch a, you know, a YouTube video together as a household, as opposed to an entertainment device, as opposed to a thing of separation. When that object is brought into the dynamic, that's where you start to see a certain kind of respect. And in some ways, this is not unlike what we've talked about as media writ large, right? Don't use the television as a babysitter. Make it a, a household activity. Um, you know, and I see that happening in certain communities and not in others. What's been challenging to me is that, of course, the phone tends to get actually given to a child you, first as a leash uh, rather than actually as something that, that is you know, driven by them in different ways. Um, and that leash is a problem in, in, in a whole variety of ways, right? We have parents literally tracking us exactly you know, what are your geo coordinates out there, but also expecting young people to be immediately responsive to things. So for example, we've had a conversation about texting while driving, you know, ignoring the fact that every cab driver in this town texts while driving, um, which I always sort of find entertaining to be here. Um, it's also pretty phenomenal to what, and, and every parent, mind you, we have this expectation that teenagers, even when they're driving, should be able to answer their phones when their parents call within four rings. And I have watched so many kids sort of stress out about the fact that they're like, they know they'll be in trouble if they don't answer the phone. They'll know they'll be in trouble if they, you know, if they do. What is the right balancing dynamic, right? And this is that moment of like, how do we then have a conversation about what do we treat this object as a leash, or when do we recognize that it has a little bit of more balancing dynamics to it? Um, and this, that's why I'm saying this is the socialization process. Um, long before we get to the, like, here, I'm going to give you a phone, go free reign. It's more about how do you integrate it into you know, every other aspect of the things that are in your child's life slowly, iteratively, in a way that makes sense. Now, I, I say all this, and I would like to point out that this is so uh, class inflected. This is a middle upper class dynamic. For a lot of working class uh, families, the reality is, is that, you know, you know, I, I meet these families where it's like the phone is the one way in which you know a mom is going to get to say goodnight to her you know child while she's you know doing a night shift, right? There's all of these other realities that we have to sort of recognize about what happens and, and how these technologies get in. And for many working class families, the internet is primarily through the phone, not through the computer. Um, and so there's these places in which it's getting inflected, but I think that we put too much emphasis on those devices rather than really respecting and going with the practices. And if you, again, if you drive it, drive it by practice, you drive it by values in the household, it becomes more integrated. But one small other final point, I saw some um, early stage research, and I'm curious whether this will pan out more at scale, which is that when um, uh, devices are introduced uh, as this, this ooh, delightful object um, into you know, uh, preschool age kids, they get obsessed with it. Um, when it's introduced as yet another toy, they go through this process of, of loving it for a period of time, as they do with many other toys, a little bit longer than average, and then it's just another toy. So there's also this weird moment of how do we introduce it. Um, the way that I started to see this out in some of the high school environments was that um, when parents had started bl blocking things and saying, you only have 20 minutes on the computer, what that meant was that the 20 minutes were entirely used for social activities and never for educational purposes. Whereas when adults were saying you have more flexibility about your time, um, the percentage of time for educational purposes was much greater. So there's all of these issues that we, you know, we still haven't worked out what this looks like. But I think that the way in which we turn these objects into being like an obsession um, ends up also creating unhealthy relationships with them. Hi, my name is Vicki Stern. I'm on the Montgomery County Commission on Children and Youth, and I'm interested in the class piece that you're talking about. Um, we right now have a particular concern about foster kids and also other young people who don't have peer groups online. So they're reaching out to strangers and therefore even more vulnerable than everybody else. Have you done some work on that? Vulnerable youth offline or vulnerable online? It's it's painful to watch. And indeed, the young people that I see that get into massive amounts of trouble online are indeed reflecting a whole set of what's going on offline. My approach to it all has been to say, you know, obviously, I would like to address poverty. I would like to address all of these systemic issues that are happening. But how do we also use those technologies to reach out to young people who are crying out for help, um, as opposed to then sort of just blaming them for these, un these problematic interactions online? Um, you know, one of my sort of you know bees in my bonnet for a while has been a desire to have uh, an equivalent of the of digital uh, uh, equivalent of a street outreach program online. What does it mean to think about digital street outreach? What does it mean to train a group of college-aged young people to look out in their home communities 
um, so, uh, for young people who are seriously running into risk. Connect them with social services. Connect them with support. Because you know, I run into all of these youth who are engaging in large amounts of expression of things that are not so good. I'll sort of put this as a concrete example of a, um, a community that I spent some time with, which is that um, in the height of the days of MySpace, there was a news report of um, a young woman um, who murdered her mother uh, along with her, uh, uh, one of her male friends. Um, they together murdered her mother. Um, the news, of course, media covered it as girl with MySpace kills mother, which is always a delight. So I dove into trying to understand what was going on, and I ended up spending a lot of time with this young woman's friend group. And for um, a year and a half prior to this incident, um, she had documented every detail of her mother's abuse, her mother's alcoholism, her attempt to get help. All of this was visible on MySpace. And I asked her friends, I'm like, so why didn't you tell somebody? Why didn't you go and talk to an adult? And they were like, well, we tried to tell people at school, but they blocked MySpace, so teachers said they couldn't look. And I was like, oh, OK. And sure enough, what I learned as the case unfolded and went to court was that um, the school had actually regularly seen you know, uh, marks on her body and had called social services. But by the time social services had gotten around to being able to investigate, they said that there was not enough evidence to be able to proceed. Of course, all of this evidence was extraordinarily visible. And so this is these moments where I struggle, of these moments where we see young people really telling that story. And so what does it mean not to hold companies responsible, because engineers should not be the ones assessing this, but to local by local in our communities be present and start creating eyes on the street. And that means putting in motion ways of, of being big brothers, big sisters, being community members online and offline. Um, and you know, I do see a lot of very vulnerable youth in this. I mean, I certainly do with Crisis Text Line. I do in my human trafficking project. Um, and they're, it's, it's heartbreaking. But for me, what's stru struggling to me is, is that I ex expect them to engage with the technology in the way that reflects what else is going on. And so I just think that it's a great opportunity for us you know, in, in civil society to think about how to, to use this to get back and, and, and address this holistically um, and to learn about it. Again, I, run down, I come down to you know, a resources issue. And, uh, this town, oh, this town, um, you know, like, you know, our, our inability to support social services, our inability to support mental health, it's, it's, it's insidious and it's depressing. Um, and if you've got ideas of how to combat that political gridlock and nightmare, I'm, I'm all game. Uh, in, in the meantime, I will sit and, and watch House of Cards and be depressed. <laughs> Thanks. I'm uh, Michael Edson from the Smithsonian Institution. And I love the way you're unpacking uh, all of these big, hairy problems in very rational, practical terms. It's part of real life. These are real life problems that reflect themselves in new ways because of these new platforms. Um, when you sort all of that out in your mind, is there anything left at the middle that the fact, the reality of this new thing that we hold in our hands, this new thing that connects us all, really does make different? Um, probably the most significant is the ability to connect to so many more people across so much more space and so much more time. Right? The idea that what you put up online is persistent, that your ability to, to bridge these networks is really phenomenal. And that that creates this powerful opportunity that all too often we, we squander. Um, we squander this amazing moment where you can look into and appreciate the lives of somebody else without having to do you know, a Peace Corps trip. Um, and how do we train ourselves to appreciate difference rather than to reinforce homophily and sameness? Um, and I think that's one of the things that you know, I, I struggle with this two-sided coin. So for example, you know, I, I miss the days of, of MySpace in part because MySpace um, had this really uh, ridiculous technical decision that allowed, that made every user, user ID um, created as the one after the next. So the first ID was one, second was two, et cetera, which meant that I could actually randomly sample every user that was out there. And this was great as a researcher, but this was also phenomenal as a citizen to appreciate the world as such radically different than it was. And so, for example, 
I would go into communities uh, in MySpace of people who believed it was a Christian organization because their experience and exposure to MySpace was purely people who were identifying Jesus as their hero and believed themselves to be wholly religious. And they were shocked when the media coverage suggested that MySpace might be something other than Christian, um, which of course you know, is pretty phenomenal when you look at different parts of MySpace. Um, and I think that this is this, this challenge and this invitation, which is how do we take this moment of awe where we are a small you know, globe, where you know, that it's not just all these individual people separated by large geographic distances, but the fact that we can actually see into people's lives, we can appreciate those differences. How do we use that, not just be afraid of it? Um, so I think that that is something that's really different. Um, in the same way that I think that the, you know, a library was a huge transformation, right? This moment of being able to get access to knowledge in a hometown was pretty phenomenal. Of course, you know, coming from your institution, like the ideas of museums, the ideas of being able to have shared knowledge. I think that this is where I'm also amazed at the information access that is just unprecedented. And that again, we squander in really weird ways. Wikipedia to me is a, a phenomenal site. And what's amazing to me about Wikipedia is not just the fact that it has you know, tremendous amounts of information, but that the process of how that information was made is made visible. You know, that just those discussion pages where you can actually see the debates. And you know, I describe in here um, you know, my delight at, at trying to make sense of the American Revolution uh, Wikipedia entry, which because it has to resolve into English means that the British and Americans had to resolve this, this entry, <laughs> right? And it's fascinating. It's just like, are they terrorists? Are they revolutionaries, right? Like when you're just, you see this conversation unfold and I think of my own household. So, you know, my, my grandfather is British and he, he brought my mother over to the U.S. Um, when uh, she was a teenager and she came home with an American history book uh, produced in the United States and he thought that this was complete rubbish and immediately threw it away, right? Because of course the way that he understood the American Revolution was very different than the way that she did, or the way that American society did. And yet how do we actually appreciate the fact that you can see those debates unfold? Um, and those are the moments, like the, that, those details of the internet that I am just in awe of. Um, that ability to connect us to information, that ability to potentially connect us around the globe. And I think that what I'd hope is that we don't let those amazing dynamics uh, get lost in light of our own you know, fears and anxieties. And this is pretty phenomenal. It's an amazing tool that, you know, when used right, can do amazingly empowering things. I think we have time for one more question, if one more question exists. Hi, Dana. Um, so I am going to just ask for, as when you're looking at uh, these teens, by and large, who don't have the kind of technical expertise that was required when you or I were teenagers to get online, um, I mean, one analogy that's often used is cars. So like in the 50s, people were all into repairing their cars, and now people just want to drive places. Mm -hmm. um, but I, what I wanted to ask was whether or not within your travels among uh, teens, there was a subset that you found that was more technologically savvy or, in, or, or engaged, or whether there was, to, to what extent, if, if at all, you saw like varieties or I variation in the level of technical engagement that different teens had. And is, you know, is there kind of like a, a, a core of nerds in there somewhere that's going to have a, have a more direct grip on the technologies. Yeah. I mean, so I always struggle with that analogy, the analogy to cars, which I've, um, in part because I think that, no, you didn't necessarily need to tinker with your car in order to drive it. That's a good thing. You know, I, I tend to break things more than I, I fix them. Um, but the ability to understand mechanics was actually really critical to the labor part of the society for a long time, to uh, what it meant to, to be able to be a participant and be independent from other institutions. We have actually done a good job of undermining that entire aspect of our economy in ways that I'm not sure are a good thing, um, in outsourcing a that aspect of the economy in ways that I'm not sure are a good thing. I would like to not be doing the same thing with technology. I would like to hope that we actually help raise more people who are technologically sophisticated um, not just under the rubric of we need STEM education, but like the, the curiosity-driven technological capacities are so phenomenal for being able to build things that are only in your imagination. Um, 
And so even when I look at schooling, you know, we have, of course, more AP computer science courses than what we had when you and I were, were growing up. And yet that doesn't necessarily mean people are thinking sophisticatedly about the kinds of technical dynamics that are, that are transforming society. Um, you know, to sort of play off of a geek, more geeky element to it, there's some really phenomenal shifts that I'm seeing happening in terms of you know, data analytics, for example. So you know, take something like databases. We have historically you know, helped people engage with relational databases. They required a very particular kind of architecture, a kind of thought logic um, that meant organizing data in really phenomenal ways. What happened is that below the radar, below the AP computer science classes, not even relevant to the computer science courses at the universities, we saw a transformation happen to a NoSQL model. Um, we saw a transformation happen to MapReduce and all of these other you know, technical transformations that is actually driving this conversation about data analytics without people you know, who are using that material understanding how that change in architecture is phenomenally insightful to this, this country. Um, I don't want everybody to be a computer science, but I want a computer scientist, but I want everybody to have a level of technical literacy where if I say algorithm, you have a sense of what I'm talking about, that you can see the cultural work that is done by an algorithm. Um, and we're not even close to being there. Are there you know, a group of adorable geeky youth out there? Oh yeah, I love them. They make my heart go pitter patter, right? Um, and they're, you know, they're doing it in spite of their school situations. They're doing it as a hobby. They're doing it because it's fun. They're doing it because they got into Minecraft and they just fell in love. They're doing it you know, because they wanted to, you know, to break a DRM for their favorite anime and they're just going to figure out how you know, come you know, any means possible. That hasn't changed and it's still such a small percentage of those cohorts. Um, and what I would love to do is to see that kind of tinkering mindset that kind of curiosity and interest-driven passions around the technical tools that we have available to us sort of be nourished and encouraged. And I don't see a lot of that. I will also say that I really miss moments in which technologies were not so clean. My favorite of which is, is MySpace. Um, you know, again, that was the sort of weird era of things. Um, for the geeks in the room, MySpace was a technical disaster. It was built on cold fusion, which is a horrifying thought. Um, and in spite of that, in, in spite of that, part of it was a, it was a SQL style mechanism where people didn't even realize that you um, they didn't check what was in the forms before they inserted it into the tables. So it meant that teenagers could quickly figure it out that they could put a bold tag into the forms, and all of a sudden it changed the you know the style of the of the text. And then you could put in you know more sophisticated HTML and some C, you know CSS and JavaScript, and all of a sudden we saw the rise of background or layout culture. And what ended up unfolding in that environment were all of these teens experimenting with their MySpace profiles and teaching each other how to do these sophisticated backgrounds and layouts. And it meant an amazing amount of technical literacy, all to make your page look like a horrible GeoCities explosion. Right? <laughs> and that was fascinating. Um, but we, we need those, those breaks, those things where things aren't so perfect. Um, and I will say that this is true in, in literacy as well, like, you know, fan fiction. Fan fiction is best done when the author has done a poor job of filling in all the details. So you have to fill it in yourself. The same is true with technology, and that's why I'd love to encourage more of that. And I'm happy to sign books. And thank you so much for coming out this early in the morning. Yes, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.